welcome back to Ladies of Another View on Back. And I want to introduce, reintroduce our guest, Sue Ellen Browder, who is the author of Subverted, How I Helped the Sexual Revolution Hijack the Women's Movement. And she was talking about her time at Cosmopolitan Magazine, where they were told to make up stories, fake news back in the 70s. What kind of stories were you supposed to make up? Okay, well, Harold, Helen Gurley Brown actually had a list of rules on how to make up those stories. When I wrote Subverted, I couldn't find those, that list of rules. I kept it for 50 years, but I found it in the garage um, about uh, when I was writing an, another book, Sex and the Catholic Feminist. So here's one of the rules. This is actually from her list. Try to locate some of the buildings, restaurants, nightclubs, parks, streets, as well as entire case histories in cities other than New York, even if you deliberately have to plant them elsewhere. Most writers live in New York. 92% of our readers do not. So the idea was that by making up these stories and planting them all over the, the country, it made the sexual revolutions um, views seem much more widespread than they actually were. Here's another one. Unless you are a recognized authority on a subject, profound statements must be attributed to somebody appropriate, even if the writer has to make up the authority. And here she says, here's an example of what you can say. If you want, bad, all psychiatrists are basically Freudians, better. According to one practitioner who specializes in group therapy, all psychiatrists are Freudians. So, of course, that's not true. All psychiatrists aren't Freudians. But by giving you a, uh, an expert to, that, who said it, somehow it makes it sound real. Boy, we see a lot of that in our press today. According to sure. experts, according to experts, according to... Uh, experts. And it's like, who are these people? Who are these you experts? Know? Yeah, yeah. 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 Were you just make? Was it just sloppy journalism? But was there an agenda? Because well, there we haven't. An she was. The... She was selling products, and she was. She was uh, promoting the sexual revolution. Um, she never had children. Uh, she may have had some abortions along the way, and there was an agenda to to. Uh, to make a lot of money. I mean, we, if you've got all these beautiful women and, and you're and you're selling products, that that was what it was all about. Helen wanted to be rich and famous and successful, and she was. But when she was 72 years old, she told Psychology Today that it was no fun to wake up scared every morning. That's so just it's just so her. sad. Yeah, that's just so sad because she never had any faith in her life. And as you can attest to now, where you in uh, your was it your fifties? You have um, became a Christian, and uh, but isn't that just sad that someone like that, her whole life was attaining to something that she could never attain to? There, that's uh, right. there was no faith in there. She had no kids, nothing to look forward to. <laughs> She, was she had it all. She had it all. She had it all, but she had nothing. She had, she had nothing. nothing in the end. She was married to the same man for four, for over 50 years. Uh, David Brown, who was the producer of Jaws and Driving Miss Daisy. And when he died, she put on his tombstone, he was married to Helen Gurley Brown. Oh, wow. Not, nothing it. about him. That's that's the woman's that was the hijacked women's movement. Yes. To me. Yes. That yes. The women became the dominant and the male voice was just supposed to go away. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it seems like it's still that way today. But it's really sad too when you think about I was wondering, as you were going through all this and while you were at Cosmo, did you ever get invited to some of I'm assuming there were parties, there were men that were still in control of a lot of the world that wanted the magazine to kind of go this way or that way. Were, was there ever any of that that you know of? I didn't go to those parties. No, I wasn't <laughs> invited. I wasn't that important. Remember, oh. I was there I was there as, as basically a secretary in the magazine. I was seeing all this stuff. And then after I left the magazine, I was only on staff for about six months, but I wrote for the magazine for the next 20 years. Oh, so wow. well, I was a freelancer for it most of the time, but I saw this inside, but I was not one of the important people on the inside. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I'm wondering to what degree things were made up. Did you, was it just sloppy journalism? But you were making up stories that never happened, right? With characters that didn't exist. Right. It was, it, I told you, it wasn't really sloppy journalism. It was, it was an intentionally fake journalism. It, was it wasn't really journalism. It really it was not yeah. journalism. <laughs> yeah, it we got to stop fake. using that word. Yeah. It was, it was they were but, lies and made up stories. But here in the middle of it, here's the interesting thing. These stories about the sexual revolution were the ones that were made up. I also wrote articles on those harrowing headaches and medical articles. I wrote an article on how to buy a used car. Those were legitimate articles. So it was very hard for somebody to tell that these things were made up because the, the definition of propaganda is half truth, selected truth, and truth out of context. There's always about 90% of propaganda that's true. And that's what's happened. And even in these articles on sex, um, some of the people that we quoted were true. We were real psychiatrists. So, so propaganda is not a bunch of lies that you can completely find. It, there is half truth, selected truth, and truth out of context. It's 90% true, it's the 10% that gets you. So what do you think of uh, now when you watch like the Me Too movement and the feminism and the way it's going, um, blowing out of everything out of context? I mean, did you ever see this where it was gonna go to this point? Well, no, you, no, of course you can never, you know, I was not a prophet. I couldn't predict this. Yeah. <laughs> As I say, that's why when I when I people began to ask me and I saw how much damage it done, had done, that's why I felt like I had to write this book and, and set the record straight. When you and, go ahead, Carmen. Well, I just wondered if you had any kind of an insight on how much of a part do you think Cosmo played in furthering the mindset that abortion was okay, that it that you it wasn't it was just a clump of cells. It was all the things, you know, the science wasn't there back when Roe v. Wade was decided to really reinforce that's a baby, you know. Right. How it much was, do you think? It was a it was, Cosmo was very important. Why? Because it was the first sexual revolution magazine for women. And then all of those editors on that magazine fanned out into New York City. So you had all the women's magazines started sending the same message. You had Glamour, you had Vogue, you had all these magazines sending the same message. Um, and Cosmo was the first and they, and they spread the word. Yeah, I mean, I, they pretty much were the leader in the sexual revolution mm -hmm. and that's the way women's magazines went. And so everybody was trying to, to feed that frenzy of, you know, women could do anything. But in the end, like you say, now you're in a different generation and you're, di you're seeing that it didn't lead to happiness, right? Well, of course, I didn't. I mean, it didn't make me happy too. Before, before it was all over, I had an abortion. I got sold on it myself. And that left me very anxious and depressed for years and years and years. And it wasn't until I found God that I found freedom.